Hello and welcome to this next video in the introduction to historical wargaming. One of the main questions I get asked when I mention wargaming to people is just how do actual wargames work? So in this video I'm going to give you the very basics of actual wargaming mechanics. If people were played with toy soldiers I guess it would typically be when they were kids either setting their soldiers up, flicking them about, rolling marbles at them or using any other method of knocking them over. It's what I used to do and I'm fairly certain I'm not alone in this. When H.G. Wells wrote what could be considered the very first set of wargaming rules, which were called Little Wars, the rules in fact actually call for using matchstick firing cannons to fire at your opponent's figures to knock them over. However, with all the time and effort that you spend on painting and building figures, I dare say your opponent would take a very dim view of you chipping away at their paintwork. I've mentioned it before, and the closest comparison to wargaming would be chess. This is where two opponents will move pieces across a board in order to defeat the other. In some respects, wargaming is very similar, but generally games are not as prescribed as a chess match. In chess, movement and combat are pretty much combined when two pieces meet. In wargaming, we break down each turn into component parts. We'll take a look uh, at each in a moment, but first, let's just have a look at how turns actually work. So I said with chess, as in wargaming, each player will generally take a turn. Depending on the game, a turn could represent a time period from a few seconds, even up to a few days or more. Typically, a skirmish game will represent a few seconds per turn, whereas a large-scale strategic game may mean that each turn represents an hour or a day or even a week. There are huge variations on this, and it all depends on the rules that you're using. But in general, a war game is governed by what we loosely call the turn. Different rule systems will employ different types of turn, and it is the simplest form of this which is called the I-go-you-go. Go. This is a system that means that one player takes a full turn, and then their opponent takes a full turn, and then it goes back to the first player. This is, again, similar to chess. However, you generally get to activate all of your units in that turn, and this may include moving them, firing with them, or any other actions that are allowed in the game. This is a very basic game design. It's been around since some of the very first war games were written down following the Second World War. However, turns can also be randomised by some mechanic in the game. For example, in the Two Fat Lardies game, I Ain't Been Shot Mum, the game uses a set of cards to activate units. If your particular unit card is drawn, then you get a chance to activate that unit. This adds a certain amount of friction to the game, as neither player knows exactly which unit will operate next making you take decisions based on the best knowledge at that time. Units may also be activated by dice rolls, uh, tokens being drawn, or a host of other ways of having randomization added to the game. This does reflect reality a little better in my opinion, as not everything is linear in real life and events can take an unexpected turn very quickly, especially during combat. Another way of allowing units to activate is by what we sometimes call initiative. Although it may have different number of names, this represents how well a unit may react to a situation, either through quick thinking, good training, or just circumstances. In a game using initiative to activate usually means that the player with a better initiative can decide to go first in their turn, or allow their opponent to do so, if it's advantageous. So for example, a unit of French Grenadiers is facing a unit of conscript Hanoverians. The Grenadiers have a higher initiative, so they can decide to move first to attack, fire before the conscripts do, or wait until the conscripts have done their move and then react to it. Although there is less friction than the random activation systems, this allows players to really think exactly about how they want their units to react to the enemy. These are only three ways in which some of the games play. And there are many, many more, including a combination of these, variations of other ways of allowing each player to take a turn. What a player can do in a turn is also the next question to tackle. So speaking generally, most wargaming turns have a few basic elements to them. There are generally movement, combat, both hand-to-hand -hand and missile, and then also morale. Again, each set of rules will handle these entirely differently depending on the scale of the game. As our toy soldiers are representing real life soldiers, they're also able to move about the battlefield to get a better position for defeating the enemy. Distances are usually measured in inches, mainly because the war gaming games originated in the United Kingdom uh, and also at a time when inches were the standard measurements. Centimeters may also be used, 
but to be honest it's rare that you see them in rules. Also movement rates can be dictated by the size of your wargaming table. Most tables are about six foot long by four foot wide Depending on how long your game turn is supposed to represent allows us to define how, how far a figure can actually move in that turn. Some rule systems have worked out what the ground scale is and they've calculated that against how long the turn is and then derived at a set amount that a soldier can walk or march in that amount of time. However, that said, most rules use a distance of about 4 inches to 6 inches for a foot soldier to move normally in a turn. This may increase if they are running or charging, or decrease if they are moving stealthily or taking cover. This distance can also be decreased if the figures are moving through rough terrain, such as woods, swamps. It may also be increased if they are moving on a road, which obviously are much easier to navigate than a ploughed field, for example. All of these eventualities will be covered in their particular rules that you are using. Obviously people travelling on horses will also move faster than somebody on foot and this is also taken into account for cavalry movement and again for vehicle movement with them moving even faster. Each type of vehicle also have different moving rates. Combat is another large part of a turn in a war game. Uh, this is obvious from the name of the hobby but it's worth having a look at it in general as there are two kinds of combat. You get hand to hand or what we call melee and missile fire. Hand-to-hand -hand combat usually takes place when units from opposing sides come into close enough contact to stab, punch, kick or bite their opponents. Uh, weapons will generally will range from swords, axes, spears, up to bayonets in the modern times. Depends on the historical period of the game. Missile combat, as it suggests, is when your opponents throw or fire missiles at one another, such as arrows, spears or bullets. This will take the place at longer distances than hand-to-hand -hand combat and whichever set of rules that you're using will have different ranges calculated, usually in inches, as I said before, for whichever weapons that your soldiers are using. So as a general rule, an arrow will fly further than a thrown spear, whereas a rifle may fire further than a pistol. Missile combat is generally broken down into three bands, dictated by the distance. Usually this is short, medium and long. It is easier to hit somebody else at short range it's harder to hit them at long range and there will be factors to change the chance of you actually hitting your opponent and doing damage to them. So speaking of hitting your opponent, in both types of combat there's usually dice that are used to determine how many of the opponents are hit in a round of fighting. This may be as simple as rolling a dice, adding various factors such as the range or if there was a charge to reach combat with then the final number determining if the opponent has been hit. Some rules will also allow you to take a number of dice depending on how many figures are involved in the combat, uh, the weapons that they're using and also other factors, with the result of the rolls showing how many of the opponents are hit. There are many and varied ways of calculating casualties and again it would be absolutely impossible to explain each and every one of them. However, this is not all. Many rules will also calculate how many of the hits actually go on to cause casualties. This could be dependent on if they are wearing armour, or if they're behind cover, or any other factor included in the rules. So in some games, you may cause a lot of hits, but they may fail to actually kill anyone with a second set of dice rolling. Finally, as you end up killing your opponent's soldiers, they're going to suffer from what we refer to as morale. This charts the willingness of your force to continue fighting, and is usually affected by either losing your fighting strength or other factors. Rules will handle this differently, but generally, the more losses you take in a game, the more likely your force will collapse and run off the field. It's rare in a game that you fight to the very last man. For example, after the Battle of Waterloo, uh, Napoleon still had a sizeable army, but it was retreating, and the morale had collapsed. Generally, games will last as long as one side or the other is beaten, and this is tied into the mechanics of the game. Sometimes this is governed by a dice roll with various factors added, or subtracted as well, or could just be a number of defeated units reaching a certain level. As I said, different rules have hugely different ways of dealing with the various aspects of battle, but movement, combat and morale are staples of most war games, and are generally governed by rolling dice to achieve a result. The dice rolling adds a chance element that is present in real life, so that not everything you want to do is going to happen the way you want it to during a game, and you have to prepare for those times 
uh, when you just end up rolling ones. Again, just to reiterate, every set of rules that you use will handle everything differently depending on the scale and the level of the combat that they're attempting to reproduce on the tabletop. It all depends on what you are seeking to get out of a game, which will dictate the direction of your, the, your war game it will take. The fun part is actually finding that out. Well, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and it's given you a basic introduction to some of the aspects of the game mechanics. There's more planned in this series, so keep an eye out for them when they come. Please subscribe as well if you haven't already.